Hello, I'm Barry Daniel and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated ethical life, avoiding dogma or any absolute appeal to authority. Our guest today is Stephen Jenkinson. Stephen is a teacher, author, storyteller, spiritual activist, farmer and founder of the Orphan Wisdom School, a teaching house and learning house for the skills of deep living and making of human culture. Before founding the school, he headed the counselling team of Canada's largest palliative care programme. In 2008, a film Grief Walker was made about his work with the dying and their families and he's also the author of several books, including Money and the Soul's Desire and Die Wise. Hello, Stephen. Welcome to the Middle Way Society podcast. Thank you, Barry, for the invitation. OK, well, should we just dive in? You, you said once you've made something of a living by being troubled aloud. Could yeah. you tell us a bit more about that? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it's, I wouldn't advise it as a career option for anyone else. <laughs> That's the first thing to say. And uh, mysteriously, what seems to have occurred is something like this. You know, at some level, you can blame your upbringing for only so much or credit it as the case may be. But in my case, I suppose somewhere along the line, uh, I didn't even go into the death trade until I was in my, I think, probably early 40s. And and that somehow granted me a kind of, let's say, a, a kind of ballast. I wasn't tipped over so very easily by that time. And that held me in good stead because in a nutshell, I observed, uh, and I certainly don't go in seeking this, nor did I seek a, a position. I was actually uh, encouraged and, and a little bit pursued. And what I saw was what passed for good treatment and, and good consideration and professional conduct and the rest was very, very troubling to me almost immediately. You know, as you know, good good sense and decorum require that you are in the weeds for a good long time to learn the ins and outs of where you are. That's what I tried to do. But at a certain point, you know, we weren't manufacturing screwdrivers over there. We we're trying to help people die. So so there was a certain sense of immediacy about trying to reconfigure my understanding of what the job was. And I did so, first of all, as the beneficiary of benign neglect, administratively speaking. And then subsequently, when um, I began to draw some attention in the way of publicity and so on, it was deemed to be a, a wonderful thing for a while. And it was during that time that I that I kind of self-appointed in this in this direction of being troubled. And, uh, you know, it's not a personal trouble, obviously. It's not it's not axe grinding either. It's um, it's an understanding that if you have the privilege of attending to people in what could could easily be the hardest, most train wrecked part of their lives, then the very least that is incumbent upon you is to do your utter best. And uh, sometimes that means wondering what that is instead of assuming that you know what it is. Somewhere in the matrix of all those things, I began to realize that my principal job is to wonder aloud about this thing that passes for sanity where dying is concerned and you know, things of that kind. Yeah. Well, nobody hires you to do that for crying out loud. So so it, as it was, I was on the uh, ironically, I was on life support in terms of my employment for quite a considerable period of time before euthanasia was inevitable. OK, so to what extent is wisdom the ability to live peacefully with conflict, do you think? Well, you know, these are some loaded terms in the question. I'm not sure what, you know, peacefully could mean any number of things. It could mean you're in utter turmoil personally, but you don't act on it. That that could be, you know, peaceful. I'm not I'm not sure. Okay. I would guess um that the principal obligation of a human being is to be human. And that requires enormous amounts of uh you know on the fly translation, I think. Yeah. I think you can't make up your mind about what form or shape that should take until you're well down the rabbit hole of the particulars of whatever you find yourself engaged in or or the time of life that you're in or the particular kind of geopolitics of the place that you find yourself living in. I mean, it's really a question of kind of deep citizenship, I guess I would say. 
So when you say what it means to be human, would you say that to a large extent is something that we then work on ourselves? Um, I, I think it's this. You know, there's an old adage about a, a good marriage. You say, you know, speaking as a man, that I chased her so hard that she finally caught me. <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's what being human is about. It's a it's a combination of, you know, you really work your tail off to try to learn about it and disabuse yourself of so many, you know, shreds of nonsense that you gathered along the way on the one hand. And on the other hand, you leave open, you know, the lion's share of the possibilities being that you're on the receiving end of your own humanity, that you're not on certainly not on the authority end of things. It's not it's not another article of your self-expression humanity it's something that's entrusted to you as i understand it and as such it's not it's not an inevitable consequence of being born that your humanity arises and is crafted and then pressed into service by by the time you find yourself in i think that's the true mark of it that that your humanity is not a generic quality that it's actually very very time and place specific and that it's you know there's many tasks associated with it that that don't don't translate easily to the other side of the ocean or another hemisphere or, you know, 20 years down the road from today. OK, but, but in relation to that, um, so there's this idea that human beings are not born. You've, you've, right. you've said that, you know, we are made and then meaning is not hidden and elusive or something to, to be found. But meaning is also made. So to what extent are we then meaning making creatures? <laughs> You know, I should preface, and I should have done this earlier, uh, anything I say by by saying that, you know, I'm not a fan of global generalizations uh, about anything. I would really like everything I'm said, I say here to be understood in those terms, that there's a lot of caveats attached to it. Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, I think uh, probably the instinct for meaning making might be is, is the closest thing we have to an instinct. Yeah. As human beings, otherwise fairly domesticated we are, but uh, but the kind of penchant or sometimes mania, you could call it, for uh, conducting ourselves in a meaning laden world, maybe that's that's our particular burden to bear, and maybe that's an aspect of our humanity. It seems to me, mm -hmm. um, you know, meaning is you you, you discover it. It having lain there sort of awaiting you for some considerable period of time, you could say, uh, you know, meaning is not the same thing. I wouldn't understand at least as direction. Uh, meaning has to do with a, you derive pur purpose. You know, personal purpose or, or species purpose. From what life means rather than, uh, in my opinion, from the other way around. Yeah. So you could say, for example, you, you were born and. You can make a case from this alone because we know many people are, are conceived but not born, stillbirth and the rest, yeah. miscarriage and so on. So there's that. So then now you're born and then you, by some miracle, achieve the age of majority. You know everybody doesn't do that. And so on through the various aspects and ages of your life. And each one of these things, it seems to me, confers upon you or should a sense of urgency about your participation in the greater hubbub of the day uh -huh. and that you not take it for granted that you are in, in the in the presence of your full allotment of 82.6 years or whatever the current average is in the West. And you take upon yourself, conduct yourself as if you're on the recipient, you're, you're the recipient of privilege, of deep privilege, and it carries with it enormous responsibility. You know, I was born in Canada, and I'm very grateful for that. But for all of that, we are one of the more uh, deeply wasteful um, practitioners of resource extraction and, the, and all the rest. And this, to a certain degree, applies to anyone probably who's listening to what we're talking about today. And all of that means that, um, you know, our life, the meaning of our life here in the West has considerable and mostly unintended consequence for people elsewhere. So it's important, I think, when you're talking about what life means, not to be too, you know, in the manner of Aesop's fables about it all, but you recognize that there's a lot of meaning unintended, grim, 
uh, shadowy uh, with a with a distinct pallor and the rest. That's part of meaning. And hopefully we could derive from that a sense that there are things to be done in your lifetime that are not part of your uh, peak income generating potential, that there's that you, there's other aspects of meaning, which which if you're the beneficiary of being born into a materially sophisticated culture, then there's an enormous responsibility that comes with that. That's not it's more than the Hippocratic oath in the world. It's more than just to hold back on doing harm. It has a lot more to do with if you're at the top of the food chain, maybe you have to be a very good chef. I'm just thinking about what you're saying about how fortunate we are, you know, especially in the West. You know, we're in, in many ways, it's just a stroke of luck that, you know, we're not we're not now in a, a sweatshop in Bangladesh or hunkering uh, down in a bunker in Aleppo in Syria. But nevertheless, many of us in the West are somehow lost. Could you have some pointers why so many people struggle in modernity in the West today? You know, the, these are not to be answered simply, even though the answers could be reasonably brief. And one answer could be something like this. Uh, I was born into a time and place that is materially so sophisticated that, you know, it takes the breath away. And at the same moment, mythically and poetically uh, impoverished uh, without end, virtually. That constitutes the place I was born to. And there are places in the world that seem to reverse that priority uh, to the extreme. And, um, you know, who's I, I don't know myself what the greater uh, purgatory is to be uh, materially, you know, punch drunk and have have no sense really ongoingly ab about what the word we could possibly mean. Mm -hmm. W.E. And on the other side. You know, I look for, I look, I look at, I hear of, and I'm lucky enough to travel on occasion. And I get the sense there are people who are, who are deeply clear about who they are and what their place in the world might be as a people, but struggle uh, enormously because of material uh, disadvantage to really act on that in a, in a kind of profound and enduring way. And they watch their own kind, if you will, their own way of life begin to wither. And crumble under the force of the globalization that's occurring as you and I speak right now. Yeah. So um, I, th I think that largely speaking from the corner of the world that I know something about, uh, the principal um, affliction seems to be the cult of the individual, the sanctity of the individual. Uh, you know, we've achieved this, I think, by default, having lost utterly any sense of what constitutes a village mindedness, my phrase for that. We devolve to the family and then ultimately to the individual as the principal kind of truth bearing, meaning generating uh, engines of our life. And, and this is uh, an acute poverty that, you know, in my generation, there will be no recovery from. Absolutely not. Uh, I, you know, the work I'm trying to do, especially the writing and so on, I'm on the road an awful lot. Really and truly, that's at its depth what I'm probably contending with most. Mm -hmm. You have to choose your your iterations of it. I mean, it's pretty hard to 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 advertise yourself as, uh, you know, tonight's uh, program will be contending with the ills of the world, or something of that kind. So, you know, specificity is the is the order of the day. But whether I'm talking about the my time in the death trade or or my concern about elderhood or, uh, you know, money and the soul's desires or whatever it might be, it seems that the uh, marching orders for me personally are pretty much the same from one subject to the next. And that's not to solve or write a prescription or a remedy for the uh, particular poverties of contemporary um, Western people, but to articulate the poverties. I mean, there's people out there articulating all manner of solutions to a problem that they can't articulate, you know, just general ill at ease or something of that kind. And, you know, we got to do a lot better than that in terms of clarity about the dilemmas before we begin to throw, you know, all manner of attention at a sort of generic fix where, whereby we can look at people half our age and say, well, I did, I tried to do something.
That just makes me think of um, something in my own experience. I'm what's called a Samaritan. I don't know if you have a similar uh, setup in Canada. Uh, basically, it's a, an organization that um, provides a support to people in distress and despair. And it's, it's mainly you're talking to people on the phone or you uh, communicate with people through email or sometimes text, especially with young people. But there does it does seem to be sort of an, an epidemic of loneliness out there. So many people live these impoverished lives and incredible isolation at times. But our policy is also not to provide solutions. We don't have a message. We don't have any answers. We're just one human being trying to uh, make a connection with an, uh, another person. And, uh, and that, can, that can be really powerful. Yeah. But again, that's something that I think we're, you know, we're struggling with in the West, with this individualism, as you say, that um, we're losing a sense of connection with each other. Even if we're communicating, you know, through social media, etc., it's not the same form of connection as the, the embodied connection you have when you've, you're face to face with people. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Well, I think the first thing I'd say apropos of the loneliness is that uh, contemporary first world loneliness is not a failure of the individual will to get it right. It is an accurate rendering, assessment, and portrayal of what prevails. That's the first thing. You know, it's real. Yeah. It's not, you know, enough enough people who don't get it, and then you end up with loneliness. No, no, no. The loneliness comes first. And then secondly, uh, you know, the, this notion that the technology will set you free. I mean, this is not new. You know, it's it. You know, the information technology uh, is cresting at the same time that there's more lonely people than there've ever been. So let me let me offer you a parallel. Okay. I'm writing a book right now about uh, elderhood, or really what's become of elderhood, or where the hell is elderhood, or something in that order. And in the process of doing it, a simple formulation came to me, and it's almost a math uh, formulation, and it goes like this: Today. You know, latter half of 2017 in the West, we have more old people per square foot than there have ever been uh, in any kind of record. Yeah. I mean, that, by ratio and by number. Everywhere you look in the West, that's what you have. You would think then that the consequence of the proliferation of old people has the direct result of generating legions of elders who are vector out across the countryside with the obvious benefits of their wisdom. Yeah, I spoke to someone recently, an interview, Stephen, a woman from Ethiopia, and she um, she was telling me about Ubuntu philosophy in East Africa and the idea that a person is a person through all the persons. Or another way of describing it was, I am because we are. And one of the things she said, because she lives in Dublin now in Ireland, and she said, um, one thing that really surprises African people in the West is how we treat our elderly people, put them in homes and also waste this um, wisdom that is at hand with so many people. In Africa, elderly people are by and large looked up to because of their their life experience. Not It's not to say that elderly people can't sometimes be narrow minded too, but uh, generally um, in Africa, that culture of the elders is something that perhaps is dying, but is, is still preserved. Well, I'm sure there are at least pockets where that remains the case. But let's let's observe something that, that is painful and obvious at the same time. And that is that elderhood, old, are not the same thing. You know, elderhood would be a function, a sort of culturally endorsed function that's wisdom based in the rest. Being old in and of itself confers no particular wisdom on anyone that I've seen. You know, it can turn your life into a bumper sticker very readily. Yeah. You know, just, just one long life experience, you know. But it doesn't make you poetic. It doesn't make you eloquent. It doesn't make you available to people one half or one third your age. Yeah. These things are all achievements which are not inevitable consequence of you not being dead yet, you see. So if that's the case, then, you you know, to finish what I begun earlier, you realize that the proliferation of old people that has not produced elders, not in the West it hasn't. And the older we get, the less likely it is to do so. So why is that? Mm. And what my, my take on it is it comes to this. 
elderhood is a concept is something that's forged in the furnace of of endings and of limits that's how it happens and to the extent to which uh we in the west mostly medically interfere with you know all the physical limitations that are part of getting older and finally even mess with the idea that there's such a thing as your time to die i think we will find if we're not already finding it the direct consequence of delivering people unto their own decisions and priorities about all of these things in their life has the consequence of suspending their capacity to become elders when they become old the irony of it is so painful uh, but i think that's that's this is what's in the offing even as we're speaking today and by elder you mean someone that is a wise or wiser person is that what you well it's not so much an identity it's, it's more of a function you could say okay. so so by elder i would mean something like this someone who's self understanding does not lead the way what leads the way is they're um you know steeped in who knows how many decades of getting it wrong so frequently and misapprehending the world so desperately and occasionally you know stumbling on a bit of good luck and recognizing that you've done so and all of the other slings and arrows that we could agree make up a quote a quote in a normal life in the west all of those things come to bear there in the latter third of your life and these are the things that make you useful to others yeah. and that's principally what it is it's a service it's not a possession elderhood to dispense as you see fit it's a uh, it's a kind of ennobling and um burdening sequence of marching orders that comes from the troubles and the travails of your time not your personal time your cultural time and yeah. and elders are principally made crafted esteemed by the culture that we're talking about and by the particular wrinkles or torments that that culture might be enduring at any given time which is to say then that there are particular capacities in some people that come to the fore in certain kinds of troubled times. Yeah. And as certain those as soon as those troubles go into abeyance, then those skills are no longer required and those people have to go back and get a real job, not, you know, permanent leadership. Permanent leadership is a sign that something's gone terribly awry. Yeah. But then I suppose you have to have the ability to learn from your experience rather than than being blind to it i came across some interesting research recently that that argued that intelligence and education are actually no safeguard against blinkered thinking what seems to be key is the openness to being wrong and and curiosity these are maybe to to some extent dispositional qualities but they, these are things also that can be cultivated they can yeah yeah so uh, does that resonate with the idea of elderhood people who through their experience are able to to harness it and embrace it even when it's painful or especially when it's painful yeah certainly especially when it's painful number 1 number 2 i don't think it is a circumstance that one commands so there's yeah. no sense of in to my mind of harnessing or or calling it to do your bidding you know i think of the example of uh a good burgundy or some kind of you know profound red wine not that I'm any kind of expert on this matter at all but <laughs> it's it seems to me it comes to this but how do you come by the best red wine the answer is obviously is age for the most part it's age and if you if you put a certain amount of red wine into a cask uh you know 20 years later or 10 or whatever it is do you have the same amount of red wine that you started with i'm guessing the answer is no I'm guessing what happens is that the deepening of the taste in the body and so on of the wine is a consequence of the volume of it being diminished. If you take that understanding and apply it to people aging, then you might say that it is in the nature of aging that people become a, an intenser iteration of what they always were and that intensification has been achieved at the cost of being harrowed and winnowed by life and in many respects reduced and and brought to heel frankly and uh, so there's a lot of humility that comes with it and uh, you have to be able to distinguish between that and humiliation of course which yeah. is there's no upside to that from what i can tell it's something in that order you know it's a, it's a, 
It's a profoundly service driven understanding. It is not a personal possession or an aspect of your personality. Now, that's really quite beautiful, actually, Stephen. And that, that makes me think of grief as well. What, what is grief? Why is it so important to embrace grief? <laughs> um, yeah, you're asking all this, the infinitesimal questions, obviously, right? <laughs> well, let me see what I can do justice to it. That I, God knows I've been around the subject an awful long yeah. time. Um, I suppose I'd say something like this. Grief is often mistaken, at least it was where, where I worked and lived, as a kind of iteration of uh, sort of depression and despair and sadness, like this kind of Molotov cocktail of the dark side of life. That yeah. seems to be what people understand grief to be. And if you if you really pay attention to how to how people are with it, well, at least I, I did, and this is what I occurred to me over the years, that people principally seem to understand grief as something that comes at them or comes to them from, you know, choose your planet or choose your, you know, dark side or whatever it is. Yeah. The idea being that it's an intrusion into what you could call, quote, the natural order of things, unquote. No thought given whatsoever to the possibility that grief is the natural order of things. But in order to make that case, you have to distinguish it from sadness and, and despair and depression, you know, the big three and and the way you do it is to imagine grief as a skill, yeah. as a capacity to respond in a deep running and um, I would say long running way, that it's not episodic and fitful, that it's not a coping strategy. Grief is a willingness, it seems to me at the end of the day, to acknowledge the immensity and the profound mystery that constitutes life of which humans partake. And that mystery deepens the more you learn about it. It doesn't dispel. Like the burgundy option, it kind of deepens the more you learn about it. And you are more capable of being dumbfounded in grief than you ever were when your life was going pretty well. So yeah. if you had to choose your affliction, I would imagine that there's an upside to choosing grief as an affliction rather than having a normally unhappy life as an affliction yeah i um, can definitely relate to that Stephen. Um, i'm thinking of my dad my dad grieved really well when, when my mom died in the sense that he fully embraced it and he, he let it wash through in him and we became very tactile and there was lots of crying and um when i reflect back on it now i, I feel it, it was his greatest gift to me yeah no doubt well, you know, the, the largest aspect of grief, I would say, is not behavioral, as in, you know, there's a prescription in the West for grief, and it's the high expressed emotion, and it's the, you know, the things that you just mentioned. But there's a lot of grief that is um, profoundly understated because there's a degree of, you could say, withdrawal from the, from the hurly burly, you know, from the marketplace, from an unwillingness to take income tax seriously. And, you know, all manner of things like this, you know, the claim that normalcy lays upon you, you may never be able to pick that up again after grief has had its way with you. And, you know, people could mistake that for a desperate affliction, their their inability to be normal, you know, being their principal, um, uh, their new suffering. But, uh, you know, I look around at what normal life delivers to people and what they make of it. And I wonder about the wisdom of seeking it out overly. So let's imagine that you'll stumble into normal life from time to time. But if you're lucky at all, as you were with your dad, that uh, there's something about grief that that is that simply does not hold a normal life in particularly high esteem. Mm -hmm. And for all of that, it, it's not an assassin. You know, it's not an executioner. It simply proceeds otherwise. It has a different idea of what constitutes full and deep and rewarding yeah again i can relate to that in my own grieving for loved ones there's been much joy too though well you know again not being a spirit mechanic you know i wouldn't want to make a formula for this thing yeah but uh we could certainly allow something like this that without the capacity for grief i'm not sure that joy can ever really be undertaken mm -hmm. and or recognized 
and uh, and vice versa. So these things are skills. You see, you could call them two wings of one bird. And uh, minus one of them, you go in circles. So there is such a thing as the joy addicted, you know. Yes. The, the white light addicted people uh, for whom uh, a good day is a day where they only think positive thoughts, whatever those things are. And the truth of the matter is being a human being, you're capable of, you know, the wide range of things. And uh, to the extent you're a stranger to those things is probably the extent to which you're strange and not to be held in particular uh, trust, it seems to me. You know, there's a German poet, Friedrich Holderman, and, and his line went something like, you know, I intend to live a life in such a way that nothing human would be foreign to me. And that's not bad marching orders for any of us. Yeah. Once you craft a deepening understanding of what human is and that you realize it requires in equal measure skillfulness when it comes to joy and skillfulness when it comes to sorrow. And these things, neither one of these things are coping strategies until your your sun begins to shine on you again. You know, it's it, you know, life is not a department store that you go up and down the aisles looking for what soothes you and, and suits you most. Yeah. I mean, that that is the West in a nutshell, it seems to me. And even troubled people have deep obligations to the time that they live in. Sure. OK, so what is orphan wisdom, Stephen? Well, it's it's a name that I I stumbled across that became the umbrella phrase under which everything I'm all my little enterprises, I suppose you could call them uh, live. And and the phrase come comes down to two understandings. First of all, you're speaking to a Canadian here. So, you know, the truth of the matter is I do not ancestrally come from the place that I know as my home. I was lucky enough to be born here. But I have no ancestral root here and nobody my color does. Mm -hmm. So if I were to ask you, you know, what's an orphan, the chances are good that part of your thought would be somebody who has no parents. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is everybody has parents. I mean, the fact you exist is a sign of your parenting or your, your lineage, I should say. OK, so what orphanhood really is, is the inability to come to your parents in a direct way and knowledgeable and immediate way that you have to work like the Dickens to imagine them, uh, to seek them out in some fashion, to learn them and learn about them, which includes, you know, learning language and, you know, other culture and so on and so on. So certainly most of the people that come to things that I do, and I've, you know, I've traveled quite a bit to probably all the English speaking countries now, and that orphan status is really front and center uh, in the modern psyche, this sense of being a stranger in a strange land, that kind of thing. You know, if, if you go with that and you keep it there, you have a recipe for white supremacy in the southern United States, to take one obvious example that's cresting even even now again. Yeah. You, you have all manner of, of people imagining themselves to be uh, the product of this glorious age that somebody took from them. Uh, you know, in some fashion, it sounds like Germany in the 30s again, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and in actual fact, orphanhood does not mean that you do not come from worthy ancestry and, and something that confers upon you a, a, a combination of dignity and the obligation to become wise. So that's why I put the two words together, orphan wisdom, so as we don't leave one out in order to make the case for the other easy oh no that makes sense yeah okay just coming to the last question now Stephen. yeah um, uh, the the middle way as we understand it is the is the idea that we make um better judgments by avoiding fixed or dogmatic beliefs about things whether those beliefs are positive or negative then that then throws us back on experience so we're left in this sort of messy uncertain middle but it's arguably in the messy, uncertain middle that we can actually start to get to grips, perhaps more adequately with the phenomena that we encounter, whatever they are. Now, how might that relate to what we've been talking about today? Well, with all respect, I'd say probably that's your job uh, to answer rather than mine, since I don't I don't claim to, to participate in that 
in that understanding that the phrase the middle way suggests. But okay. since you are asking me, yeah. and I'm the, I'm the guest right now, I'm happy to see if I can work a little more. <laughs> Maybe it could be something like this. You know, one of the most dogmatic things is the attempt to extinguish all dogmatic things. So, yeah. you know, I'm not myself. I'm not a fan of the idea that if you get rid of the extremes, um, you have none. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very extreme orientation. Rather, I would say something like this. You know, if if the uh, if you have enough days of rain and if you're in the UK, there's no if <laughs> in, my, <laughs> in my view. Uh, but if you do, you can simply begin to proceed as if there's no such thing as the sun. Yeah. There's just this muted gray thing uh, that populates your days. And there's that's an extremity. You see, it's a matter of habit more than anything else. It's not really a matter of contemplation, it doesn't seem to me. But I guess the, maybe the order of the, of the thing could come to this. Wouldn't it be something if our understanding of being human and being alive included being bewildered, included... Yeah. You know, no obligation to be sure of yourself ongoingly, not to be con continually running for some kind of mythical office and trying to get people to vote for you and, uh, you know, persuade them that you're everybody's idea of a good time or anything of the kind that you're that you're capable of um, errancy. And, you know, we could I know we have to end. So, I'll, you know, a little etymology on that word. You and I both know that the verb to err now means to be in. You know, in, in a, a deeply abiding mistake. Yeah. Well, you know, the old, the original Anglo-Saxon, old English meaning of the verb to err means to wander. That's what it means. It has nothing to do with being wrong. What it does have to do with is the willingness to get out, walk out the door and keep on walking, leaving your certainties behind for a period of time for no other reason than to wonder if it's possible that it's not the same all over. That's what it means to to err. It simply means to wander, you see, and maybe a little more wandering away from the things that we've grown so accustomed to might not produce carnage and mayhem. It might produce something like a deep tolerance for difference and, and a willingness to see if we can thwart this globalization that uh, unless we act fairly, fairly quickly, it will become the new intolerant regime. OK, I will. Thank you very much for, for talking to me today. It's been fascinating and a real pleasure. Barry, I know we went two minutes over time. I hope that's okay. <laughs> Not at all. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.